Hey, this is Abe from Life by Abe, an expat your life, coming to you with another video, doing interesting interviews of expats from all around the world. Today we have Stefan. Stefan, tell everybody a little bit about yourself. Uh, hi, how you doing? Um, Stefan, I am um, an analyst here in Ho Chi Minh. Been here almost a year now. Here with my uh, my wife and. Now, we were talking a little bit off camera, so we're gonna kind of like go back yeah, into yeah. it. Uh, how long have you been living overseas? Um, oh, 2015 summer, so I guess we're coming up on eight years. Eight? Okay. Yeah. And, and like, where have you been? Like, map it uh, out. We start off in Beijing, we're from Louisiana. So we start off uh, going to Beijing, we were there for four years. Uh, my partner, she worked as a uh, elementary school counselor. I worked in as a support um, kind of teaching assistant. And then from there, we went to South Korea for three years during the pandemic. Uh, the majority of our time was spent locked on the island. And then last summer, we came here. What you meant? Okay. Okay. And you, China, Korea, now Vietnam. Like, what made you make the move to Vietnam? Um, I think for us, we had visited a few times. When we lived in China, we visited uh, Hoi An, and then, we, yeah, no, all of our times, because, yeah, so our, our entire visit, we visited Da Nang, we visited Ho Chi Minh, we visited Hoi An, all around it. We, we liked it. It was a very easygoing culture. It reminded us a lot of home, Louisiana, mm -hmm. uh, with the food. Um, there was a lot of parallels in the way the people interacted with foreigners. We felt a lot very welcome. Um, during all of our trips, and the, I think the cost of living was more reflective of what we were used to um, living in Beijing, and so from South Korea, it was easy for us to make the jump. Okay, okay. And uh, living in abroad so far has it been a good experience or a bad experience for you? Um, I think like anywhere you go, it's it is what you make it, and it's a mixed bag. Um, I think everybody, no matter where you are. If you're working a job and you're not independently moving, you've struggled over the past few years because of the pandemic in some way. Parents, I'm a parent, so you know, I have the same struggles. My kid has to get up, go to work, she doesn't want to do, or excuse me, get up and go to school. She doesn't want to do that. So, you know, the same struggles. I do think that um, a few of the things that I would not have to deal with, um, you know, I'm an immigrant, so you know, I have to register as an immigrant and all the things that go along with that. I'm not speaking the language, so if I walk into a restaurant, if I don't know enough of the language, will I be able to get what I want to get? Um, so little things like that, but I also don't have to deal with, you know, it's, I, I'm, I feel safe. If my partner goes out with my kid late at night, I don't worry about something happening. Um, I don't worry about something happening at the school, and so on. So I, it's trade-offs for everything. Okay, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. I, I understand. Um, I was thinking back to my time in the United States and I was like, wait, I feel way safer here. Yes, I think my things might get stolen, <laughs> but it's not going to be in a violent way. Yeah. That makes sense. So, cool, cool. Uh, all right. And then like, so you've got your goods, your bads. I kind of want you to tell me your best experience abroad, but then I want you to, or let's, fall, let's start off with the worst. Let's okay. start off with the worst experience while living overseas, followed up by the best experience you've ever had. I think that the worst experience, it's unfortunately always the perception. Um, my time in Korea was rough as a black man. Um, for my daughter, it was rough. There were times where it was blatantly obvious. Either parents didn't want her interacting um, with their kids or so on. Um, I was walking with my child one day in the middle of uh, a city in South Korea and I was approached by a man and he was like, is this your child? Like in a threatening manner. And of course, you know, I mean, my first thing is like, you don't matter. Yeah, you know, this is my kid. Yes, this is my kid. I don't have to prove that to you, strange guy. Uh, but the same thing happened in China where someone was like, is she, it was like, is she mixed? Because yeah, she is mixed and she does look a little lighter. Her hair texture is a little different, but at the same time, um, I think that in, in the West, there is a, an acceptance of, not really an acceptance, but an acknowledgement that it's a blending pot. Uh, there are people who look different, their kids will look different, and so on. 
Um, that has been my worst experience was in Korea because of my race. Oh. Okay, okay, interesting. Uh, best experience, uh, I will say it, honestly, it's been coming to Vietnam because I think that the way me and my child look, because uh, I'm, I'm mixed as well, uh, the way we look is a, it's a novelty and not one that's detrimental. It is weird to be tokenized at some points, uh, but at the same time, I know that, you know, I, I do have I do have tattoos, which I've only gotten since coming abroad. I had no <laughs> tattoos when I stayed in the, in the States. Uh, a lot of people don't really know that. Um, but I think that there is a, an acceptance of who you are as a person as long as you know, you bring your best way. You know, you're, you're kind, you're nice, you're, you're smiling, you're trying to be helpful. In Vietnam, you are accepted for the most part as you are and the kind of person you visit yourself. All right. As long as you're not doing anything bad, yeah. like, obviously, everyone's kind of like, yeah, come on in. Yeah. Uh, join us. Cool, cool. Oh, you know, those aren't, in my opinion, I don't think that's the worst experience. Um, that anyone's had or yeah. or anything yeah. and like you're saying it's relatively safe living, living it is yeah. so. cool, cool. Yeah. all right now we'll go in and you've had your best experience you've had your worst experience overall what would you say how would you compare living in china korea and vietnam to living in the u.s um china i would <laughs> China, I would say favorably. China is definitely more favorable than living in America. Um, people, it's another thing of, you know, if you, if you mind your business and you try to help out when you can and you be a good citizen, I'm not saying that China doesn't have its issues, but for the most part, if you follow the rules, what they are, even if they're a little extreme, you're good. South Korea, it's very much about status, very much uh, an, an implicit, um, biased and a lot of it's based on skin color skin color i.e if the darker you are the more likely you are to have to work in the sun and so on um i was threatened with violence at one point because i didn't have my dog on a leash uh, that was kind of scary even though the law had just passed and i didn't know about it uh and just south korea was definitely i would say i would prefer america over living in south korea where we were i can't say they're all about south korea i know i have Few friends in Korea who told me that the community we lived in was not did not depict the entirety of Korea and that they were sorry that we had that exposure because that's not Korea and so I, I understand that the community we were in very unfavorable and it was a pandemic so I will you know give that a thought to um, Vietnam definitely I would say over America it's safer um, it's hot that takes some getting used to <laughs> the the incessant constant heat the five cold showers a day. <laughs> yeah, that, that does take some getting used to. Um, but other than that, Vietnam is definitely, uh, to me, a step up because it's, de it's a developing country. Um, just in the year I've seen, I've been here, I've seen a lot of stuff. Oh, yeah. yeah. And, and that's the crazy part is, is like the pandemic uh, slowed everything down. Yeah. And afterwards, it, it took a little bit, and I'm thinking you've been here about that year afterwards for it to come in. Before, uh, it was insane how fast everything was. Like, you'd go by a lot one day, and the next day there'd be like a 10 story building on it. And how? Um, uh, it was what it felt like. It was what it felt like. So that's good. Cool. All right, so you know, you've had your good experiences, your bad experiences. I want you to think back. Right? To your first initial thought spark of, hey, I, I want to live overseas. <laughs> <laughs> Our story is very uh, serendipitous, is that the word? How you say it? Um, so we uh, were living in Baton Rouge, we had decent jobs. I mean, she had a master's degree, she has a master's degree, um, and a school counselor, and was not, you know, how it is in education in America. They're teachers, educators, counselors, they're not really paid what they're working for the job they're doing. Um, and I just worked technical support and sales. I made more money than her. And that was, that was rough, but she did what she enjoyed. And then, so, out of nowhere, um, a school in Beijing contacted her, I want to say in April, which is extremely late for international schools to be recruiting. 
um, late April and they were like, hey, we found your profile, which is a two-year-old profile. It hadn't even really gotten in her two years of postgraduate experience, but they liked her, she interviews well, and so they offered her a position and you know, we kind of, we weren't married at the time. Um, and so we kind of just like, okay, we found out mid-May we were gonna move from Louisiana to uh, July, so we got all our stuff in order, cash up for one case, sold cars, did a farewell kind of road trip up down to see our family, and then, yeah, we were gone two months later. Wow. Yeah. Uh, very fast turnaround. Um, like I said, normally international school, schools recruit and select who they're going to hire, I think, like, you know, like September, October. And so, yeah, April, May was extremely late, so they, but they didn't, they didn't play. It was a very, very it was a big school. It's, I think it's like 41, 42 years old now. Um, amazing. So yeah, they took care of us. That's, it wasn't thought before that. But when she thought she, there was a day she thought she wasn't gonna get the job, and she was so depressed about it. Like, so we're not going to China? I was like, I'm sorry, babe. I don't. <laughs> I don't know. I'm not in control of this. Yeah, uh, I, I understand. So before that, though, were you? Did you ever have that thought of, hey, I want to live overseas? Or when I was when I was in high school, I. I calculated how long it would take you to visit each country, including travel, and spend five days in each country. Little things like that. Um, I think I had ideas of wanting to visit certain places, and I wanted to visit Japan. Um, still, haven't done it. Um, but it wasn't a serious. It wasn't just. I was just kind of existing, you know. Okay. Where you know I'm smart. I can work in computers and technology a little bit. Let's do that, and it wasn't really something I thought of that I can do. Because you know how, when you're in America, unless you're in the military or something, or unless you know someone or your family, it's almost like the idea of living outside of America, American base, American existence, is and it's foreign to you, for lack of a better way to put it. No, I, I, I understand. I kind of, uh, I was in the military. That was the first... The second part that exposed me to travel, um, and so the ideas that I had before we pulled in of the place that we were going to were vastly different from when we showed up. I thought everywhere was undeveloped, and America was the only place that was developed. That's, yeah. Uh, and I'm glad that I've been able, I've been blessed to get out and travel. And I think the really, thing is with social media is different for like my nephew and everybody, but. I think he's a fairly successful producer. He's only 18, and even he, the idea of, you know, he doesn't have a passport. I think, like, one or two people in my family have that yet. Um, and so, yeah, anyway. No, no, that, that is crazy. I actually come from a family of immigrants that immigrated to oh. America. From where? From the Bahamas and Trinidad. Okay. And so, we have, like, that's part of it is like, all right, I had a passport at a very young age so we could visit family. Uh, but we only ever went back to the island uh, and home. Yeah. And, and so I was like, okay. Uh, but after joining the military and getting out to see it, that kind of sparked it. But I didn't know that it was the spark until much later. And see, yeah, I mean, my family, like, they'll now they'll go on a lot of like cruises and they like, go on, you know, Bahamas here and there and all around the, the continental but missing now I think they're plan supposedly planning a big trip to Europe this year but I, I think that was been planning since before the pandemic so okay. it takes a lot of thought for them uh, and resources to plan something like that especially with a lot of people who haven't done it, something like that before. Oh yeah yeah well I uh, I met when I was in Thailand recently and I met this guy there and he showed me a little trick to get family Pay for your ticket here. <laughs> pay for your ticket here. Mm -hmm. But when you get here, you're on your own. And, and see, you gotta get your own way back. And see, <laughs> that's great. Uh, and see, we were doing it the opposite way. We were like, if you pay for your ticket, we'll cover everything once you land. Because mm -hmm. it costs living so well. Yeah. And we, you know, we know a few people who can help us get uh, hookups and stuff. But yeah, the ticket, that is a big thing. And then don't buy the return ticket. You got your own return ticket. That's, That's a good it. idea. Yeah. That is a good idea. I was like, all right, you're all excited about getting here. You forgot about going home. Oh. <laughs> but no, that's uh, that's interesting. I I might do that to a few of my family members. 
I'll pay for your ticket here. Once you're here, you're on your own. <laughs> I, got, I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll guide you and tell you yeah. how to get Yeah, yeah. Here. I'm not going like, to just leave you stranded. Like, yeah. No. We'll, we'll go out. We'll have fun. We'll, we'll definitely rub and eat and everything. So. All right. Um, so, you know, you've talked about the good, the bad. You've talked about kind of how you made that move overseas. Thinking back on, you know, all of the struggles that you've had, and what would be something, you know, that you would have changed if you could go back and change anything in the, after leaving home? Um, I think I would have visited home less. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's not out of a lack of love for home or family, it's a love. We, those trips home cost a lot of money. Yeah. Yeah. The flights, the renting, the immediate uptick in food costs, um, that stuff starts to add up. And I think that, especially after our kid was born, I think that we should have cut back on the trips um, and insisted family visits a little bit more so we could have saved a lot more, a lot sooner. I think that's the best thing. We do love family, but I mean, this is our family. So as much as we thought two to four years, we're still here like eight years later. So. Uh, I, I get it. I get it. It's been five years. I haven't gone home yet. That, that, like, <laughs> Part of it is the pandemic, but a lot of it is, I, every time I look at it, I'm like, I could, I could go to all these other places yeah. just for the flight, like not including what I'd spend when I got home. So, all right, cool. All right, and then, like, before you guys made the move, uh, and you were saying that you, you know, you looked at it a little bit, you traveled, or not traveled, but you looked at how long it would take to travel to all the countries. And, were there any books or media or any YouTubers that kind of helped you start your journey or did you, you know, it pointed in the right direction? Um, I think she follows a couple. No, no, honestly, no. Once once we were abroad, we started to um, expand what we, how we looked at things and what we looked at things. Because, um, I mean, we, we both come from, like, you know, more middle class backgrounds and I didn't even have a, a Degree when we came abroad, which is something I have a best for now. Something that the time and resources available to commit to that is something I just didn't have in America. Um, I, I know some people do it. I just it wasn't a thought for me. I was just worried about. I mean, I was young when we came abroad. We were in our late twenties, I guess. I guess that's young. I'm not sure anymore. Uh, <laughs> and you know, it's just I was just trying to. I think I was just trying to enjoy my life. Uh, my dad I grew up very kind of strict home, and so um, you know, I had a nice car as an adult. You know, I had nice things, nice apartment, and I was like, "This is nice. I'm smart. I work. I make money. I buy nice things. Like it's good." And it was a thing of like, why pursue more of that before then? And now it's like I see how my kid is and how sharp she is, and there's a look in the eyes of the kid who knows. He's like, I'm smarter than you, Daddy. <laughs> Just so you know, I know that you've been around 30 years longer than me, but I'm still smarter than you. Um, but just having that opportunity to give my kids something that I couldn't even imagine as a kid. Um, traveling around the world, she's in three countries, she has a certificate of birth abroad, she's born in Beijing, and going, meeting different people. I think it's difficult, you know, sometimes when you have to say goodbye, especially with a little kid, but I wouldn't. I don't think she would prefer the alternative if she was informed enough to know that, you know, we, we probably have to put you in a really good public school. That's the best we could probably do if we lived in America. So. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, you wouldn't be able to afford the a private school. Yeah. Yeah. private school. A friend that I coached uh, in Beijing, she was a lifer. She raised her kids in international school. Her kids teach in international school, go to that international school. And uh, it's like the three generations have the same international school. So they're lifers. Because she told me that from pre-K three to twelfth grade is five hundred thousand dollars at least. Wow! And that was back in twenty fifteen. No, we didn't know. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, it's, and having the opportunity to provide that to your child, probably they cover about ninety percent of the cost. I mean, we got uniforms, food, stuff like that. But that kind of tuition for especially for a little black girl, you know. Dude, that's in, that is. I mean, that's the kind of a pro of looking abroad. It is. It is. Getting out. And health insurance. Health insurance yeah. and education. Health insurance. Yeah. yeah. Health insurance for sure. <laughs> I, uh, I'm paying significantly less for far more coverage 
than I was yep. in California. Like, yeah, I could have easily been like, oh, this is the worst thing that happened to me, like a little minor bike accident, mm -hmm. but it wasn't. I could care. Take care of it's straight. I'm good, you know. I, I insurance fully covered it, you know, in and out, no problem. And yeah, nice, nice. Do you have a license here? I do. I, I do. do. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I was gonna say, so like, uh, you remind me of somebody that I met uh, a long time ago. That really didn't have a license. Insurance wouldn't touch him. Like, was in a yeah. bad situation. But still, even in that spot, like, broken femur, tibia, fibia, uh, three weeks in the hospital. Um, to do like three different surgeries to get them all set up. It would cost them like three thousand dollars. Wow. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> our, having our kid, I think we paid uh, fifteen hundred US. Fifteen hundred US. Cut everything else: the hotel stay, the birth, um, the doctor, the wet nurse, the cover. Wow. And that was in uh, Beijing. Beijing, Beijing. Yeah. Which, like I said, Beijing and Vietnam to me, the GDP is similar. The cost of living is very similar. Okay. All right, now I'm going to uh, I'm going to hit you with a uh, a curveball, going to off completely different from where we're at. Uh, culture shock. Whoa! <laughs> Can you explain like what you felt, how you got over it, and like? So Beijing, we we did not do well when we landed there, man. And the school was great. The school was the best landing we've ever had. It was so smooth. Because the school was on it. Like at the last, the latest two places we were going, to Korea and Vietnam, we've been having to run the schools about things. And I know in Korea, is the school is not as established. In Vietnam, it just is what it is. And sometimes, you know, it, we, we got here, we're good. But um, it's a developing nature. But in Beijing, they took care of us. They took care of everything was. And we, it was just, it was so different from us. Like I said, we were poor. She, she did a little modeling in her teens and late and early twenties. So she went to California a little bit, but that was pretty much it for her. Um, I had done a little bit more traveling for work and friends and stuff like that. So I've been up and down the East Coast, uh, but we were simple. And I grew—I was born in St. Louis, grew up in Georgia, and I moved to Louisiana later on. Um, and just so Beijing, whew, big, big city. Um, Louisiana is a small town. It's a joke we make. Louisiana is a small town, so Beijing is huge, obviously. Sandstorms, freezing cold winter. Um, the language was the, like, the least of the issues. I mean, most of the time they're like, "Oh, this is just another dumb foreigner." <laughs> they know who doesn't speak the language, especially when you end up in those little expat pockets. Um, but everything was different. The language is different, and you don't notice it either until you are, you know, at a hotel or a hospital, and you're trying to find your way back to your hotel room or back to a cab. You're like, "Oh shoot, I have to call a cab now." Or what does the sign say? I need Google GPS. Okay, this does not work. Google doesn't work in Beijing. It just yeah, this is like it's a constant. And then sometimes you uh, a lot of insects. Yeah, it's springtime. Yeah. Uh, so if, you, if you're if you're wondering why we keep moving and swatting, we are sitting outside. There's a massive, beautiful lake behind it, behind the camera. Um, but we are outside. It is one hot from towel and two a lot of bugs. A lot of bugs. I know this is being known. Um, Love it. And so I think when I got to Korea, it was le it was less of that shock because Korea is much more Korea is much more developed. Korea, Korea is, um, I think honestly on the development scale is further along in America. And so there are a lot of things that uh, wait did they have the talking toilets? Like not Japan? not where we went. Okay. But the hotels in Busan. Um, I'm still like that that, that whole Busan trip away, I just I love it. I love Busan. Uh, the technology, the infrastructure there, the public transit, just amazing. And that Busan and obviously Seoul much more like Japan. And Je I mean Jeju is an island. It's still technically developing there in some well, some old areas. Um, but I think Vietnam was difficult because I went from working virtually only to working in the office. And so I had to deal with the work culture shock in addition to culture shock because I think people confuse when you visit somewhere and when you live somewhere and visiting is great it's fun and everything but it's not the same as living there it's not you got bills to pay you got a, you got a job hopefully or something to support yourself um, you have social circles that you have to mingle in and out of and with your job you have a kid even more so and yeah working and, and traveling 
and visiting or like just three different things. So working and moving to Vietnam, it was a definite shock and I don't think I got over it. It took me months, a lot longer than I expected to, um, to get used to. Cause it's a lot more laid back. Korea is like tight, you know, and Vietnam is not like that. And so that, that change was difficult for us. Um, just kind of more, more like Louisiana. It's kind of going back to that kind of laissez-faire, uh, chill kind of attitude. But you also get the lanyard with that. I don't know if you know what lanyard is. No. It's almost like a baker's dozen type thing, you know, but we only charge you for 12. It's okay. just a little something extra on the house. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's kind of how Vietnam is. It's, just kinda, it's laid back, but people will always look out for you. My partner was like, if you were really injured, you might be a John Doe in the hospital, but you're gonna get to the hospital. Yeah. Regardless, they're yeah. gonna pick you up. There won't be an ambulance, but they're gonna make sure you get to the hospital. Yeah, they, they might strap you to somebody. And like, yeah, you're holding on. You're yeah. knocked out. They're just like, yeah, man, get him there. <laughs> I've I've actually seen police officers like a bad accident, a person's knocked out. They'll wave over a taxi. Like, two people pick them up, throw them in the taxi, the taxi drive them to a hospital, <laughs> and then like, all right, cool. And I, in my head, I'm like, who's paying for the taxi ride? Because <laughs> you know that taxi yeah. driver's getting paid. Uh, but no, that's that's interesting. And then like, were there? Did you have any tips or tricks to get over the culture shock? Uh, find something you love. I um, during the summer when we were like you know doing our farewell and trying to move in before we moved abroad, created this little playlist uh, that I would go outside to and with my dog and I would just like chill and listen to that playlist, just kind of vibing and thinking about you know looking up at the stars. Still had that playlist. It's changed a lot. There's a lot more world music from places that I've seen, you know, watching in different channels and things that I've experienced. But I would say probably 20% of that playlist is the same. So something you're familiar with. Uh, so I think, you know, if I'm feeling down, I'll go look at, you know, some Kevin Hart stand up, something that makes me laugh. It's something that even if I've seen it a hundred times, that familiarity is what you're, is what you're craving. Cause that's what Kulish Shock is. It's that your, your nervous system having a hard time adjusting to the fact of things are completely different. Like I remember the first time I saw a centipede, I did not know what it was because I, ha I had never seen one. And, and the, 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 the fauna, the plants, everything is different from what you grew up around, especially if you didn't travel much outside of your region. You know, I think finding something that you are familiar with, pictures, music, especially media, um, you know, pictures, something to make you laugh, music, um, I work out, meditation, things that you can build a routine and that you know like this is what's going to happen and no matter what's going to happen out there, you, know, you can't predict it, especially if you don't know the language. Um, you know, you can create your own sense of routine and familiarity at you home. Know? Create your own little routine. Yeah. No, I, I completely understand. Um, so we you kind of touched on language barriers, so we're not going to jump on that. Uh, I think the, net, the last big question gonna kind of follow along of what tips would you give to a family member or a friend uh, who's thinking about moving overseas or wants to do it? What would be like your number one or your top three tips that you would talk about? Get your passport. That is number one. Get your passport now. Um, it's not, I don't think it's very expensive, but the longer you wait, we had to do a fast turnaround. So we paid like half a grand, like each piece of ours. But if you don't need to do that, it's not that much, and it takes a few weeks. Um, so that is the number one thing. Two, I would suggest learn a language. Um, we have, we, I, mean, I know a little bit of Mandarin, I know a little bit of Korean, and I know a little bit of Vietnamese, um, enough to get by through my day to day. Uh, but our situation is different because we're kind of just going with the situ with whatever works best for us. So. You know, we find someone we like and it works for us. We ended up on an island during the pandemic, which it was great. We, other than we're having to wear a mask and a couple of uh, things shutting down, our lives were not disrupted and like nearly was what I was here. We heard it was here, obviously not in Beijing and even parts of America. I, um, we didn't have to worry about those things on the island and that worked. And afterwards we wanted to come out, be around a more social place. It's warmer, um, it's a bigger city and this is where we ended up. So. I think where we are now, we're gonna focus more on learning Vietnamese, learning rules, regulations, laws, and policies because we hope to invest a significant amount of time. And I think that if you're going to move overseas, I would say pick a destination first. 
um, we just kind of happened into Beijing. Uh, but every move since has been something that we invested a lot of time researching, invested in learning basics. We took Korean classes before we moved to Korea. Just the basic, in my opinion, quality of life maintenance of where you're moving to. Okay. Um, and three, visit your family if you have them abroad. <laughs> if, you have, if you have someone who lives in a place, it's so much easier to go to that place. Uh, because you can get an invite. It's difficult to just go. It's not. It's less difficult, but there are places where you have to jump through hurdles to go to if you don't know someone there. Um, I, there's a funny anecdote I heard about a woman going to a, a place in Europe that's considered boring by the locals, and her visa request was denied because why do you want to go there? Yeah. And so, yeah, if you have someone who lives abroad, go visit. I mean, it's great. Like, you, one, you get to spend time with family, especially if they're close family. Um, and two, you get to visit a new culture and just learn a lot about something you had no idea about. You think you learn certain things and whatever the American information you have about whatever specific country, it's not, it's not, it's not, it's, not, it's just not going to work all the way through. Yeah. There are a lot of gaps there. And there's only so much that... There, there are things that you can come here and you'll see that are very different than what you'll see on television or even read in books or anything like that. Um, and there will be experiences that you'll have that are not filmed. Uh, if you come here, you'll see things just driving down the street. A five minute drive down the street here can, yeah, can be mind blowing and altering and life altering look if you run into certain things uh, but you won't ever see that on TV or, or anything so yeah all right and then uh, so normally I name the video off of a quote that someone has said in the video <laughs> first person that I'm actually going to ask uh, is there any quote or anything that you have that you want to share you know other than the tips but like that you'd want to share to anyone else um, hmm. I will say, ensure that you live in the present moment. I live in the present moment and travel. Uh, and it's, it seems like there should be a comma there, but it's not because there are so many opportunities that just happen organically. Like, you said that you were going to try to, you know, tricks to get your family to come. I, when I was growing up, I didn't have a family I remember abroad that I could visit. I would have loved to when I had a family member or a friend who lived uh, in the state. I visited them. And so that is something to me that matters. If you have a close family member who lives abroad, live in them at the moment and visit them. You would visit them if they live close by. It might be only once in a lifetime, but that's the point. You know, you were sharing that story with me and that, that story had a profound effect on me, you know? Because he, he had all these plans. But the best laid plans, you know? Yeah, yeah absolutely. And, and, you know, I've got my family, and, you know, everyone who lives abroad has their family. You should absolutely take full advantage of that. Even if you come over, I will probably make a place for you to stay. Uh, if you're family, if you're a friend, I love you, but I'm going to put you in a hotel nearby. Because, uh, yeah, uh, but if you're family, I'll let you come and stay at my place and, and whatever. Uh, you know, and I'm, I'm, I'm assuming you do the same. Honestly, I would probably put my family in a hotel just because I know what they like. They want the <laughs> hotel experience. Okay. Which is great, you know. I, I think Renaissance is our favorite brand in Beijing. Like, the, um, the people there knew our child. And they were, and Serafina joining me today. <laughs> so, I mean, but those are experiences, again, we would not even think, like, oh, this international chain knows us wherever we go. Yeah, you know, that's something. And, yeah. No, that's... <laughs> You know what the experiences that you get uh, living abroad, or just even traveling. I think um, yeah, frequent travelers probably have a similar experience. It's not their experience because they get all those miles. Yeah. <laughs> so, <nice. laughs> all right. Well, I think that'll do it. Thank you very much for coming on. Oh, my man. Yeah, appreciate it. Uh, if you like this content, hit that like button, subscribe. If you want to come on the channel, just uh, drop me a message down below, um, or I'll put my email address in the, the uh, little thing down below, and you can reach out to me. Uh, until the next time, stay awesome, stay traveled, love you.